Hi, I'm Pete Warden, and welcome to the latest screencast in the uh, Tiny ML series. And today I'm going to be talking about quantization, uh, which is a really important topic for trying to actually get machine learning running on the kind of small devices that we're going to be targeting. Um, and I'm actually going to be using a, a lecture that I've been uh, giving as part of a Stanford course, um, E292D, um, where I try and delve into the history um, and the current state of quantization. Um, I'm also going to be showing you a couple of uh, Colab notebooks that you can use to play with real neural networks and understand how you can actually experiment and get a bit of a feel for how uh, these neural networks cope uh, with quantization and why quantization works. So I'm mostly going to be focused on uh, model quantization, uh, starting first with quantization of weights, which is the simplest way of um, tackling quantization, then talking about how you actually do calculations in quantized form rather than floating point, and at the end talking a little bit about some of the other choices um, and some of the things around training, FP16, uh, bflow, and things like that. Um, and as I mentioned, there will be uh, practical uh, Python scripts that you're going to be running um, yourself uh, to actually play around with some of these concepts. So model quantization. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how I found myself working with quantization um, back in, I guess it was uh, 2013. Um, I was working with AlexNet, uh, which was one of the first um, released large image uh, recognition networks. Um, and it had 61 million parameters uh, in weights. And these weight parameters were each stored as a 32-bit float, which meant they took up four bytes. So the file for AlexNet, um, the saved file was about 244 megabytes. And what I was trying to do at that time was actually get an application, an example application running on an iPhone that was able to do image recognition using this network. But there were a whole bunch of limitations um, around how big an iPhone app could be. Um, I would rapidly run out of space uh, in RAM if I tried to use more than about 100 meg at the time, I think. Um, and even shipping an app on the App Store would have been really, really hard. So I had this blocker uh, to getting um, this example application that I wanted to get out, out. Uh, I'd actually got the code running, but I couldn't get it out because of the size. So coming from a graphics and an image processing background, uh, the obvious thing to do was try and think about some uh, compression techniques um, to try and shrink these weights uh, down to much smaller than four bytes uh, per value. And the first thing I did was actually look at what the weight values were for each layer, like what the actual values were. Um, and this is often uh, skipped over uh, when we talk about doing complicated data analysis, but just sitting down and kind of browsing through um, the arrays of data and just kind of trying to get a rough intuitive feel for what um, the patterns are and what the data looks like is usually the first step that I try and do. It's incredibly useful. And what I found was that all of the weights were usually um, in a fairly small range. Um, they tended to be, um, you know, under 100. Um, and usually somewhere around between minus 10 to plus 10 or even less. Um, so that was my first clue. It gave me an idea that these weren't 
randomly distributed across the whole kind of number um, line, uh, there was actually kind of limits um, to the magnitude of these numbers, which was already helpful. It meant that you could take note of the minimum and maximum values and be confident that there weren't going to be any uh, numbers outside of those. Um, and so that you can actually get a feel for this yourself, um, I've put together a Colab notebook that loads the Inception v3 model um, that I think was first released somewhere around 2015, but is pretty representative of um, you know convolutional neural networks in its um, weight properties um, uh, still today. Um, and this notebook uh, will take about 10 minutes to run, installing all the dependencies, um, but I'm just going to uh, switch over to it and show you the completed results. Um, but if you want to uh, grab the notebook yourself, the link is here, um, and I'll include the link uh, in the uh, notes to this video as well. Um, so if I just leave full screen, um, you'll see I've got quantization explorer one dot ipython notebook. Um, the very first thing you'll do is uh, build and install flat buffers uh, because we're going to be accessing a TF light file in flat buffer form. Um, so we need the flat buffer compiler to generate the Python code to actually access uh, the flat buffer that we want. So that will take a few minutes if you run it yourself. Um, we'll then be grabbing the TensorFlow code and then running the flat buffer compiler on the TensorFlow light schema to generate some Python code so we can actually access uh, the flat buffer uh, contents. Um, then we do some uh, Python magic to import the things we need, including pulling in the Python files that we've just uh, generated from the flat buffer uh, compiler here by making sure that we have the syspath uh, including uh, the place where we've generated them. Uh, then we have some utility functions um, and these are just uh, convenience uh, functions that take a uh, flat buffer object uh, in Python and actually turn it into a more familiar Python dictionary. Um, and then we actually get to the point where we're able to download and load the model um, into memory. And then once we've done that, we're able to create a Python dictionary from the model data buffer that we've loaded. And we can print out the information about the tensors uh, in this graph. And Tensors hold information about the arrays of values in this graph. Um, and one of these um, is actually the conv2d params. And this is the weight parameters for the first convolution operation in the graph. Um, we notice that it's buffer number 186. Um, so if we uh, go down to the next uh, section, we actually use that index to get the raw weight data from the buffers array in the model. And we cast it into something that we can deal with as an array of float32 values in NumPy. And from that point, we can then just run uh, the min and max to get what the uh, minimum and maximum values are for this layer's weights. Um, and you can see, like I said before, they're well below p positive 10 to minus 10. In this case, they're like minus 5.4 to, you know, roughly positive 4.4 or 4.5. Um, and you can actually also plot a histogram of the distribution of uh, these weights. Um, using matplotlib. And you can see here, here's a uh, histogram distribution. And I'm going to be talking a bit more about what this distribution tells us. But this is the kind of exploration that I was um, doing uh, back when I was first starting to look at model quantization. And this is the sort of thing that gave me um, some clues 
about how uh, model quantization might actually work. So you can also actually um, look at the model yourself and look at it in, I like the Netron uh, visualizer um, that you can find up on GitHub. Um, I'll just show you uh, what that looks like here. I've already loaded this in. Um, and it's this convolution with the 32 by 3 by 3 by 3 weights uh, that we were just looking at. So we're having a look at this uh, first um, set of weights. Uh, the math works out that there are um, 864 elements uh, in this first array. Uh, as we've seen, they fall within a fairly restricted range. Um, and that pro plot of the histogram showing the distribution of the values um, between the minimum and maximum is really interesting because it's very tight. There's a lot of zeros. There are actually very few values above or below two. Um, there's a long tail. Um, where a lot of the histogram slots are empty. And looking at properties like these made me think of the simplest way that I know how of encoding these values. Um, and that is taking uh, th real numbers like 32-bit float values that are holding um, approximations to real numbers. And especially if you have a limited range, just linearly encoding them into some encoding. And you know, coming from an image processing and a graphics background, using an 8-bit encoding uh, what seemed naturally uh, the first thing that I would try. And you end up with something like this diagram, where you're taking these values on the number line and you're slotting them into the nearest buckets on this 8-bit um, encoding space. And then when you want to get float values out again, when you're doing the decompression, uh, you just take the midpoint of the um, bucket where the 8-bit encoding um, is defined and you just use that as the uh, reconstruction. So you effectively end up doing rounding um, of the values to within some uh, small delta. Uh, that's the overall effect on the float values. And just to give you some pseudocode, um, take this with a pinch of salt because as I'll talk, um, there's a lot of nuances and subtleties around how this works. Um, but you're doing a scaling down um, and a rounding to get into the buckets. And then you're taking uh, each bucket value and reconstructing it to be um, the kind of midpoint of the bucket uh, in this kind of pseudocode here. So one thing to be clear here is I'm not talking about doing anything different in the actual calculations. Uh, in the code I was looking at, the only thing I cared about was the file size. Um, all of the math I was doing was still happening on the reconstructed 32-bit float values. It was just a way of um, storing the values at rest uh, in a much smaller form and then reconstituting them uh, before we actually wanted to do um, the math on them. And there is this rounding error uh, that you'll see uh, something around the you know range over 256 divided by 2 um, that you're going to end up with when you're reconstructing the values. So to my great surprise, this first attempt actually worked. Um, the accuracy and the latency of my code and the model really didn't seem to be substantially affected at all, but it reduced the size by 75%, which meant that I could deploy this on an iPhone application um, and even um, as a large web page. Um, now, I'm walking you through my process because I think it might be helpful for you to understand how we get to quantization from the usual uh, floating point type math that we often associate with neural networks. But I'm not 
at all claiming to be the first or the only person to discover this approach. Um, it was just that there wasn't much um, uh, focus in the literature on uh, these sort of uh, techniques. Um, when I joined Google, um, you know, I discovered the first version of the TPU uh, was using um, a more advanced 8-bit uh, quantization approach. Um, people in other teams like uh, Raziel Alvarez, um, who's been a colleague for a long time, he had been doing uh, work on this. Um, I think um, I'm sure that there were a lot of people who had kind of come across this approach and even more advanced approaches um, because it was the obvious thing to try. Um, but there wasn't much written about this because the initial focus of ML research was, oh my God, we've got these models. Can we actually get them working at all um, in any form uh, without trying to make them particularly efficient? Um, but there started to be some great papers uh, coming out um, around uh, how to do this kind of work with limited precision. Um, and I've got a couple of links in there. There were a lot more that I could include as well. But what I found most interesting and one of the things that really got me excited about neural networks was that this sort of property seemed very, very different than the more traditional numerical algorithms that I was used to. Um, you can't normally just knock out uh, precision and have a calculation come out mostly unaffected. So why is this? And I have this intuition that neural networks are in domains and are trained to work with these really noisy inputs, things like images, audio, natural language processing. And the noise in the inputs is actually much larger than the kind of noise that you can, you can picture the rounding errors that are introduced by quantization as a kind of noise. Um, and a noise that's much less than the noise that naturally occurs in the input data for these models and that propagates through the model. Um, this is all a bit hand wavy though. I haven't been able to actually show this. Uh, I've tried a few experiments that um, I haven't uh, panned out to try and um, sort of prove um, this property, um, but at least it works for me. But I would love to see um, some more uh, theoretical work in this area about why um, networks have this really interesting and useful property. And one of the things that was most intriguing was that if neural networks are robust to these kind of precision errors in the encoding of the weights, um, how about doing calculations in lower precision too? Um, how about uh, being able to do training in lower than 32-bit float precision? Um, and what about lower bit depths than 8-bit? Um, what does this mean for existing hardware and how can we maybe design new hardware uh, to support this? Um, and one thing that will probably have leapt out of you as well is we're doing this linear encoding, but a lot of the buckets are being wasted because um, there's this very non-linear distribution of um, very non-uniform distribution of uh, the weights across the range. Um, and some things that have kind of jumped out of my experience over the last few years and what I've learned from colleagues is these networks are robust, but rounding is really, really hard to get right and really easy to mess up uh, because rounding can introduce a bias. And as I mentioned, it's great being able to do this sort of quantization if 
it's a random error that you're introducing that will hopefully kind of cancel itself out. But if you end up kind of with an error that's biased towards one direction, uh, it turns out, especially going through multiple layers, that will spoil accuracy really, really quickly. Um, so getting the rounding method uh, right is really important. Um, and it's super easy to have um, errors uh, creeping in. Um, and I often rely on uh, my colleagues like uh, Rocky Rhodes and Benoit Jacob. Um, they are incredibly good at sort of figuring out all the nuances of these kind of rounding methods. Um, another thing that might not be obvious from the distribution, um, but that is really important, is that there are many more values that have the real number um, in, of value of zero, exactly zero. So if you have any encoding error for zero, um, like we saw the peak in that distribution, then that encoding error is going to be repeated much more often than you would expect by kind of a uniform distribution of um, values. And zero also shows up around the edges of images with convolution uh, with padding as well. So it's important to actually get the encoding of zero um, exact uh, so that you reduce um, the oversize effect that that encoding error will have otherwise. Um, some other things that have been tried are hey, look at the extreme outliers for the weights. Um, and um, you might say, well, let's just get rid of those extreme outliers and have more encoding buckets for the sort of minus two to plus two um, sort of range, for example, in the, um, in the case that we had uh, there. But it turns out that those extreme values are very important uh, for the uh, results, um, the overall model accuracy. Um, and one uh, fun thing is that uh, rounding to floats and then storing the values, uh, rounding as you would for, you know, into 256 buckets, but then storing the reconstructed floats um, actually helps drastically reduce the final file size when you're zipping um, your results, which is what you're doing for, um, you know, I think Android or iOS apps. Um, so that's actually a, a neat little um, hack if you don't want to uh, touch the file format. And we've already talked about sort of model compression. Um, there's a lot to talk about with inference calculations. Um, I'm going to briefly cover uh, training uses of um, lower bit depth as well, but I'm not going to uh, focus intensely on that. And I think now's a good time. I've sort of talked you through some of the basics of one application of quantization, uh, but why is it so important? Uh, you know, why is it worth spending all this time talking about this stuff? It's the first and most obvious way in which neural networks are incredibly different workloads to um, other uh, algorithms that you might have um, been used to. And traditionally, you know, computers from, you know, Babbage onwards have been um, driven by these very analytical numerical computing tasks. Um, and they almost always demand very high levels of precision. Um, any errors that you have in there will tend to, um, you know, compound. Um, so you have to keep the errors as small as possible. Um, neural networks are radically different. They're essentially trying to do this kind of pattern matching on very noisy inputs. And to be able to work at all, they have to build in redundancy and robustness during that training process. And what this all means is that you have these very stark differences between uh, traditional analytical calculations and what neural networks need out of um, the kind of arithmetic and math they're doing. Um, you can get away with uh, small numerical errors as long as you're 
somewhat careful and they just cancel out, uh, which is not true for most analytical calculations. Um, you're also doing calculations that don't depend on the contents of the data. You're not going to be doing branches or conditional data access on um, the contents, the input of the data that's going through uh, this neural network, um, which means that you know exactly what instructions and memory the program is going to be accessing for a long, long, long time ahead, um, which is very different from uh, a most traditional analytical computing where you're constantly kind of branching and making conditional executions on um, and conditional memory accesses on the depending on the contents of um, the data that's coming in. Um, and in traditional analytical computing, you're probably not going to be doing that many arithmetic operations on um, a given piece of data. Um, so you end up doing a lot of fetching and storing of um, values to and from memory um, compared to the number of actual arithmetic operations you're doing. Whereas neural networks um, tend towards very high numbers of calculations for each um, value that's read in uh, from data. You're, if you're doing something like convolution, you're using different combinations of weights um, of the same weight value with different inputs and that same input value with different weights. Um, so as long as you're smart, you can avoid uh, fetching um, those repeatedly and just do a whole bunch of multiply adds uh, with the same uh, values in registers. Um, so you have this very high arithmetic intensity. And at a higher level, analytical programs tend to be scripted as uh, some kind of procedural language with kind of business logic and all sorts of other stuff interspersed in kind of a general purpose language um, that needs, an, you know, a, an interpreter or a compiler that's able to cope with that kind of general purpose language. Whereas neural networks, you build them up out of high level layers that most of them express very um, chunky uh, math operations that might involve hundreds of thousands or millions of arithmetic operations uh, within each layer. Um, and you don't need that same kind of um, ability to run general purpose programs. So that means that the hardware and to some extent the software world has responded to these properties. You know, things like, oh, we don't need the precision, so let's do stuff in 8-bit and even lower arithmetic and uh, see how we can improve our latency and energy usage there. Um, let's not have predictive caches, which are trying to kind of second guess the uh, data access patterns and the, um, the branching patterns of software. Uh, let's take our knowledge of the neural network to heavily pipeline um, all of this arithmetic anyway. And with that heavy pipelining, like let's really try and pump up the arithmetic capabilities because there hasn't been that strong of a reason to have lots, of lots more arithmetic than data access um, for traditional workloads uh, because you'd never use all of that extra capability. Um, but now we can. So hardware designers have been sort of rubbing their hands together and excited about the ability to add arithmetic capabilities um, that will actually be used. And instead of having to support kind of GCC and sort of general purpose uh, languages, we're seeing a lot more hardware that's just saying, hey, give me the high-level specification of the ops that you want to do, and I will take that high-level specification and map it to my hardware, rather than trying to um, work at the general purpose uh, computing uh, language level. And what this has meant has been that things have got really exciting in especially the hardware world and the software that's driving the hardware. 
um, a hardware architect um, uh, was telling me a while ago um, that honestly he was starting to feel a bit bored um, <laughs> up until uh, neural networks really came along as a workload a few years ago because things had been very predictable. Um, neural networks have this whole different set of requirements and it's meant that um, it's had to pull a whole lot of creativity from people who are building and designing systems. Um, and, you know, there have been some uh, unexpected winners like DSPs, a very, you know, venerable and old school um, kind of in category of um, microprocessors. Um, it turns out that all of the SIMD 8-bit multiply ads that they need to do for um, signal processing um, at low power uh, are incredibly useful for doing a whole bunch of neural network applications uh, and as well. So uh, they've actually uh, been very well positioned um, to help us with that. And quantization is probably the most visible example, the most visible weird thing about neural network um, workloads that makes them very different than uh, the other kinds of algorithms that you might be more familiar with. So what I'm really hoping to get across is we're talking about embedded applications here um, and that's the focus of TinyML, um, but I find them a really useful um, space and domain to learn more generally about the engineering characteristics of these neural networks. Um, and I believe that knowing how neural networks behave is going to be incredibly useful um, over the next uh, few decades. We're going to be using them all over the place. They're going to be uh, very, very useful um, at doing this kind of pattern matching and understanding how they behave is going to be super, super helpful as you're trying to build systems around them. Um, so I'm really trying to share, you know, some of what I've learned um, and, you know, much of it I've picked up from, you know, colleagues um, inside and outside Google um, so that you can go into this world with, uh, you know, a good foundational knowledge of this is how these things behave. So I talked about quantized weight compression. Uh, now I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk about using quantization during uh, the calculations. Um, and like I said, I think this is not something that I've seen anybody be able to claim as a particular discovery. I've heard that, uh, you know, Jan LeCun back in the, um, you know, 90s uh, was, uh, you know, looking at how low you can go with the uh, quantization for weights and activations. Um, and I've heard like, you know, second or third hand um, from him. So, I, you know, this is... Um, Definitely not something that I'm trying to claim any, um, you know, credit for, but I do want to talk about the properties um, of doing calculations in quantized form and why you might want to do that. So the first weight compression was all about how to shrink the file size. Um, but since we're just taking... 8-bit uh, values and converting them back into floats, um, it seems like, okay, at least one side of um, the multiply adds we're doing is already reduced precision effectively to 8 bits. Um, what if we could reduce the other side's precision as well? And then actually, um, how would that help us doing our calculations? Um, and to help us understand this, um, I've uh, stolen some of my own diagrams uh, from uh, some of the blog posts I've done on this and just trying to talk about how we're doing um, the calculations and how they all boil down into um, uh, matrix multiplies, essentially, for the really um, 
heavy lifting convolutions and fully connected layers. Um, and in pseudocode, uh, we have um, this uh, kind of equation. Uh, we have a whole bunch of nested loops, but within the innermost nested loop, there's this um, output is equal to some indexed input by some indexed um, weight, um, and we're accumulating into that output value over these three inner loops. Um, and what this effectively is, uh, this section here, is it turns into this dot product where you're taking a set of input, um, a vector of inputs and a vector of weights, dot producting them together and taking the accumulated result. So with weight compression, uh, we're effectively doing this decompress of this 0 to 255 um, bucket value, this encoding value, uh, to get a, a float uh, value out. Now, what we really want to do um, to be able to do everything in 8-bit by 8-bit um, math space is also quantize the input. Um, and here I've got a slightly different form of that um, quantization encoding uh, that we had before. Um, and this is rounding a uh, float number to some arbitrary uh, step value. Um, so if you had the step value be whole integers like 1.0, rounding 3.14 would be 3.0. If you set it to 0 0.1, like, um, you know, a tenth, then rounding 3.14 would be 3.1. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And to just take a pause here, why are we trying to get to 8-bit integers? Um, from the hardware side, it's a lot easier to do an 8-bit integer multiply add than a 32-bit uh, floating point operation. It requires a lot fewer gates. Uh, it means that um, you can actually perform this also with a lot less energy. Um, we also only have to fetch 8-bit um, values from memory, uh, which reduces um, the load on the memory system by a lot. Um, and there's a lot of existing hardware out there, especially in the um, microcontroller and DSP space, which doesn't even have floating point hardware. So we can actually be a lot more portable if we can do everything in integer arithmetic. So just um, taking a look at the um, model accuracy when we take this approach, um, it turns out that the accuracy really isn't heavily affected uh, when we do this kind of rounding. Um, and it's the same intuition that we have for the, um, uh, for the weight compression. Um, these networks are set up to cope with noise. Um, and as long as you make sure there's no uh, bias and the um, rounding error doesn't grow too large, uh, you can actually get away with um, quite a lot in the uh, inside these calculations. Um, so you might notice as well that the quantizing that we're doing on the right hand side for the weights um, looks pretty similar to the quantize function uh, for the weights um, that we had in our weight compression. So we already know what the min and max values are for all of our weights once a model's been trained. So we can actually figure out a step value that allows us to fit um, the uh, weights um, to kind of give uh, the same effect as the um, weight compression function that we had earlier. Um, and the biggest difference here is we're doing these 
dot products. And these dot products really want to be on signed values. Uh, you want to be able to have negative and positive weights. Um, you remember the weights in the Inception V3 uh, model that we were using earlier were actually um, in the range, you know, minus 5.4 to like 4.5 or something like that. Um, so we really want to have um, the ability to have negative and positive uh, weights and uh, activations. So we need these signed 8-bit types. Um, so in the compression process, it really didn't matter whether how we were storing the codes as long as we had 256 of them uh, because we were mapping them using the min and max back to real numbers. Now, we're trying to actually do math with the compressed versions of um, these codes now. So they actually need to um, map to um, numbers directly. They need to be signed uh, because we're actually treating them as numbers rather than just as pure codes. Um, so that actually complicates uh, things um, a little bit. Um, and I'll talk about how um, there's this idea of symmetric and asymmetric quantization um, in a later slide. But I just wanted to call that out. And here we have um, the original weight compression that we were looking at. Um, we had each value um, map, uh, you know, the lowest value mapped to zero and the highest value mapped to, um, you know, 255. Um, and we really didn't care about where um, zero ended up in that encoding. Um, it could map um, any arbitrary uh, range of values. Um, and so this is um, in contrast to what we are going to be looking at, known as an asymmetric representation. Uh, because the min and max values can be um, anywhere in relation to zero. Um, there's no uh, restrictions on that. Now, we really need to be able to do math on these numbers. Um, so the encoded version of um, zero should always produce uh, zero. Um, the negative version of um, uh, the value that are feeding in, if you're multiplying it, should always flip the sign. And there should be a linear relationship between the encoded value and the real value that it's representing. Um, because we want to directly replace all of the float uh, representations in this dot product with 8-bit numbers. And that's where these uh, requirements come from. So. If we want to be able to do that, there are a few things we need to do. First off, we need the integer representation of zero to map um, directly to the real value of zero and vice versa. So we need to make sure that um, whenever we have zero in the real domain, it comes into an int zero, and that means that any multiplications by it will um, kind of uh, also result in zero. Um, so that is the kind of the first key point. We have this signed integer representation. And in order to have zero be zero, we need to have symmetric scaling on either side of zero. Um, and what that means in practice is that we have to take the absolute maximum of the uh, two min and max values um, and use that as the uh, as the range. So in this case, for the inception uh, weights that we were looking at, that means going from um, like 5.4 is the largest of the kind of 5.4 and 4.5 min max range pairs. So we have to go from minus 5.4 to plus 5.4 um, for our, um, for our range in order to compress it into um, the signed uh, int 8 representation. And one really nice thing is that we've made sure that the real number 0 um, is represented exactly as a 0 integer. And as I said, 
earlier, zero is kind of special because it shows up a lot more than other numbers. Um, so having a lossless encoding uh, for it is a really nice property to have. This though makes things a bit awkward because a signed integer always has an uneven range. The negative uh, range uh, using two's complement is always uh, one more than the um, positive range. Um, and I've actually got a slight typo here that should say plus one, two, seven, I just noticed. Um, so we have to leave minus one, two, eight unused and map the smallest negative number um, the most negative number to minus 127 rather than minus 128. Um, so we only have 255 coding points. Um, and this is really easy uh, to uh, get wrong in subtle ways. And it's something I've uh, got wrong quite often. Um, we're also leaving a bunch of the range unused because we've had to take the maximum of the absolute values of the range. So that means that we're going up to, we can represent up to positive 5.4 uh, for the weights in this example, um, but you aren't actually going to be able to um, use the, the extra uh, range because none of the weight values are above 4.5. So you have even more uh, wasted encoding values. But what this means is that we're actually able to use these quantized signed representations uh, to do the dot product. Um, and because each signed 8 bit, um, 8 by 8 um, multiply gives a 16 bit signed result, and we're summing a whole bunch of them um, to perform the dot product. Um, we are going to be accumulating them into a signed 32-bit result. Um, and one of the uh, tricky things here is I've talked about quantizing the weights, but what about the activation um, inputs, the numbers that are coming in from the previous operation? So. The theory for this is exactly the same as for the weights. You take the minimum and the maximum values and you figure out how to do the encoding between those values. Um, but we don't know what those minimum and maximum values are ahead of time because there's something that emerges from the calculations when we actually perform them on the neural network. But we need those values in order to do this kind of scaling. Um, and this is one of the most complicated things about quantization. Um, we have to figure out what the likely input activation range is. Uh, we can't just tell from inspection um, because the numbers that you get depend on both the weights that are attached to the layer, but also the input values that were fed into the um, layer um, itself. Um, and it's still uh, still quite a puzzle. So I'm going to talk through some of the attempts to actually tackle this. Um, the most obvious one is to say, hey, we're doing these dot products. Let's figure out what would happen if all of the inputs were set to the values that would um, provide the largest possible output and do the same to figure out what the mathematical smallest possible output of the um, dot products for a layer could be to figure out what the range of its output um, uh, activation values would be. Um, the trouble is that the, as you've seen with the weights, um, and the same holds true with activations, you don't have um, the values being kind of uniformly or distributed at the extremes. Most of the values kind of cluster um, within quite a small part of the range. So if you 
choose the extremes to figure out how large things can get, the, the possible ranges get extremely large extremely quickly. So the analytical calculations, um, if you use them, would rapidly become useless because you'd end up um, having such a large potential range that your quantization would um, be far larger than the actual occurring um, range that you see um, in practice. And so you'd end up with almost all of your uh, values falling in within just like a single bucket in the middle because the range is just so large. Um, so that rapidly um, destroys accuracy. Um, so one thing that works pretty well is saying, okay, I'm actually going to calculate this at runtime. I'm going to figure out what the min-max values are um, and use that uh, for the encoding range. Um, this is nice because it doesn't really require any extra developer work um, and it makes good use of the encoding space. But a lot of hardware really does not want to kind of be inspecting the, um, the outputs of its um, calculations at runtime and kind of blocking on those before it does uh, follow up. Um, like scaling calculations to go from the 32-bit accumulated value down to the 8-bit. So it actually makes um, a lot of hardware designs um, uh, unhappy, especially with things like pipelining. Um, so even though it's the most transparent thing for the user, it's not um, very convenient for a lot of hardware and even software implementations to do this. Um, one thing that can help is if you're aware that you're going to be deploying to a quantized platform uh, during training, then you can keep track of what the min-max values for each activation layer are um, and try and store them somewhere and then um, use those for the um, uh, scaling afterwards. But in a lot of cases, uh, the people who train a model and the people who deploy a model are two separate teams and it's very hard for the deployment team, once they've been handed a model, to go back and say, oh, do you mind retraining this because we're going to be deploying this on something quantized. Um, but if this is possible, it's really nice. Uh, it does allow um, some fine tuning of the model as well so that the model should work better with quantization. Uh, be more accurate with quantization as well. So if organizationally you can manage this, um, this can be very useful. Um, you can also put uh, restrictions into your training. Um, you know, you can say, hey, I've got ReLU, which is um, make sure that no activation values are below zero. Um, let's try something like ReLU 6, which maxes out um, activation values at uh, the real number of six. And then you know um, ahead of time what the possible activation ranges are and that they're quite constrained uh, just from the architecture. Um, like anecdotally, I have seen um, this uh, kind of approach have some slightly odd results um, and make it harder to achieve overall accuracy because, um, again, intuitively, it feels like the limited range kind of pushes um, the weights to kind of compensate for that limited range. Um, though, again, this is not something that I've experimented enough to be able to sort of, you know, put my hand on my heart and say uh, that this is uh, this is the case. Um, and some other, like, uh, activation functions like TANH naturally have uh, their own fixed limits too. So if you're already using them, uh, you can tell what the activation range is. Um, and the uh, most commonly recommended approach with TensorFlow Lite is... Um, actually using post-training calibration. And what this means is that you run through some representative example inputs and you observe what the activation ranges um, actually are. Um, this does work well. Um, I always struggle a bit because I have to put together a, a calibration input data set and feed it in. Um, but once you have done that, um, it's um, it, works, uh, it works really well and you can get a very nicely uh, trained um, or very nicely uh, quantized model out the other end.
So, one thing that I've also found with a lot of these approaches is, um, unlike with weights, activation range outliers um, aren't as uh, crucial. So you can actually do things like just use the 95th and 5th uh, percentiles as the limits to exclude the kind of the real outliers. So you get more precision uh, within the sort of inner number range. Um, and also, just because I've made this mistake far too many times, make sure that your encoding function actually saturates at the min-max range and doesn't kind of like loop back around from, you know, minus 128 to plus 127 or something nasty like that. Uh, because you'll you'll see some really poor performance from your model, and it won't be obvious why. And I briefly mentioned that we're accumulating into an int32 uh, because we have all these 8-bit um, dot products, but there's a whole bunch of nuances there as well. Um, we know we're producing a 16-bit signed result, and that there's a few hundred of these maybe in each dot product. Um, and just kind of basic math will tell us that we're not going to be using more than like 25 or 26 bits of that 32-bit int um, total. Um, but as I mentioned before on the activation, uh, when figuring out the activation ranges, um, a lot of the results that we're actually getting out of this are very small. Um, so we, in practice, often see only maybe 20-ish bits of the whole 32-bit um, uh, range used. Um, but at least on modern CPUs, we don't have the option of doing a 20-ish bit register. Um, so we have to use 32-bit registers. Um, but this does open up some interesting um, approaches, like because we expect that most of the values will be far below their theoretical maximum, we can actually cheat a bit by multiplying and accumulating into a 16-bit accumulator, like, you know, 2, 4, or some number of the um, multiplies, um, as long as we saturate with kind of the knowledge that we're unlikely to be... Um, in practice, uh, hitting uh, those saturation points, if um, if that's helpful on your hardware, um, and then obviously at some point you need to take those 16-bit accumulators and accumulate them into a higher um, bit depth value. But if it allows you to do um, a series of eight by eight into 16s and multiply adds, um, that can actually be uh, pretty useful. And the Tricky part is, okay, we've done these integer, signed integer um, math. We've got this integer number. What does that mean in a real value? And it turns out that what we can actually do is take the housekeeping numbers that we had for the, like the input step and the outputs uh, and the weight step um, and figure out what the uh, accumulator representation is. Um, so I've got some math here uh, that kind of, you know, shows you how it works out. Um, you just have to kind of keep track of what the encodings and the scaling that you have for the um, real value to int8 values. Um, and then you'll be able to figure out uh, what the um, each integer um, increment, each unit in the accumulated value actually represents, and then just multiply them out. So that means that um, we have to go um, from uh, the uh, values that we've accumulated in a 32-bit accumulator into something that we can then feed into the next op. And the next op is going to be expecting um, 8 bits. Um, so we have to do this kind of um, scaling and then clamping um, of the uh, calculated range um, to get uh, the results that we want. And 
it's actually even trickier um, than we were talking about because we can't do this calculation using uh, floating point uh, because we don't know if we've even got floating point. So we have to do some combination of shifting and multiplying um, to get um, the uh, result that we want. Um, and it's really easy to overflow beyond 32 bits um, or use the wrong setup to get um, too little precision um, or even get the rounding wrong. Um, you know, we often have to do something like add, um, add a half, you know, in unit terms to this to get the uh, rounding correct. Um, and the code for doing this um, can easily become a performance bottleneck, especially if you start straying into 64-bit uh, integers to deal with the overflow and things like that. Um, so just uh, watch out for this if you do run into it. And one other wrinkle that I want to talk about is uh, something that has actually really helped our precision, especially with the post-training quantization. Um, and that's the fact that each convolution uh, is made up of a whole bunch of different uh, kernels. And each kernel has its own natural range. So, so far we've been taking all of the filters uh, weights in a particular convolution layer and looking at what their overall range is. So, but some of the filters have high range, you know, large ranges, but a bunch of them will have much smaller ranges. Um, but using the standard weight quantization, we would just take the maximum range and we would quantize even the smaller filters um, into the buckets defined by that much larger range. Um, but it turns out that there's a really cheap way to have each filter, um, each filter's weights be scaled to fit each filter's range and then just uh, sort out the difference during the accumulation stage. Um, and the dot product that we're doing here um, is what we're uh, doing in a standard way. So if we actually um, take um, the uh, weights for a particular kernel, um, we know that for each accumulated um, int32, all of the uh, weight values, all of these are all of these are coming from a, a particular um, weight kernel. So what we have to do is um, we scale these weights, these int8 uh, weights, to fit in with an individual kernel's range, and then we keep track of which kernel is contributing to which um, accumulator, and we scale the accumulator differently to compensate for this expanded or shrunk range um, as kind of a uh, vector um, scaling factor. So instead of having a single scaling factor for all accumulators, we have a different scaling factor depending on which output channel um, and which uh, weight convolution kernel um, this is coming from. So there's also Another um, wild and wacky uh, thing that we can actually uh, benefit from. Um, and that's, uh, you know, I talked about going to symmetric ranges for the int8, but it turns out we can actually, if we, um, we can enable asymmetric ranges for the activations um, and do a whole bunch of pre-calculations ahead of time so that we actually don't pay a runtime cost. Um, though it does make the uh, math um, substantially uh, more complicated. Um, and to understand more about that, I've actually linked to the uh, TensorFlow um, page, which explains a lot more about what's going on there. Um, as you can tell, <laughs> there's a long history um, to this kind of quantization. Um, and it's taken us a while to get here. And you can see where we're actually um, at with TensorFlow Lite here. Um, 
And, you know, it's it's not just us. There's some really great work happening um, all over the place. Here's um, uh, Facebook's uh, work that's happening too. Um, this is a really important area uh, to actually get right, especially for um, embedded devices. And you might be wondering, okay, what about recurrent neural networks? I've been talking about convolutional neural networks and recurrent networks are actually pretty different. Um, they fundamentally involve a lot of small changes um, to kind of some stored memory. Um, so that means, especially for quantization purposes, they have very different properties to convol uh, convolution uh, networks. Um, there hasn't been uh, much work published on this, um, but I'm hoping uh, to see more coming out soon. And another question I get a lot, especially from people coming from the embedded world is, why are you messing around with this weird kind of range representation when you could just use uh, fixed point arithmetic, which is very well understood. Um, and for an example, um, in our representation, that means constraining the min and max values to be um, powers of two. So if you had weights that went from minus 10 to 10, um, you would actually um, set the min max to be minus 16 to 16. And then we could just represent uh, that in an 8-bit value uh, very straightforwardly with kind of the sine bit and the, um, you know, the, the digits and then the uh, fractional bits. Um, the tough part for us is that we're in this constant fight to preserve as much accuracy as possible. And this fixed point representation wastes some of the range. Um, and it seems to hurt overall model accuracy too much. Um, so that's why we haven't been able to kind of standardize on going for a fixed point approach. Um, it is super tempting though. It would make uh, a lot of the uh, mental math I have to do about all of these things a lot easier if we could go there. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe it will happen in the future. Um, there's been some fantastic work around going way below 8 bits. Um, and the hard part has been actually finding um, hardware that's actually going to be a able to support it efficiently. Like FPGAs have been able to work with lower than 8-bit bit, uh, bit depths because they're very flexible. Um, it's been hard to even use 1-bit networks efficiently in software on existing CPUs. Um, Xnorder AI did some great work around this. Um, and I keep hoping that there's going to be a lot more work on binary networks. Um, it's even hard just to do kind of the the pop count um, that is the equivalent of the accumulation um, for the dot product. Um, doing the sort of pop count is not something that's particularly well optimized on existing um, CPUs. Um, though I would point out OctoML are doing some uh, great work in this area too. So what about quantized training? As I said, I'm going to sort of skip lightly over this because I've spent way less time um, thinking about it and it really hasn't been the, the focus of, um, you know, what I've been working on. I've really been focused on inference, but um, it's an obvious extension. So why is it tougher? Um, we don't have a lot of the information that we have once a model is trained. We don't know what the weights are going to be, what the ranges are going to be. Um, the weights and the activation ranges are going to be constantly changing. Um, so any kind of fixed encoding um, strategy is not going to work. Um, and also training is all about doing very small nudges to value, to weight values, to get them moving in the right direction. And doing very small deltas uh, to values is something that um, these kind of very low precision uh, formats are very bad at um, enabling. And we tend to use a lot of things like desktop GPUs, um, and they've always been uh, very float focused. So if you're doing training on them, 
your starting to see advantages now from using some different data types, but traditionally they've been very, very float focused. Um, and, you know, apologies as well if I'm missing uh, some of the prior work in this area. Um, I really haven't been, you know, focused on the training side. So I'm, I'm showing uh, my lack of knowledge. But one thing, uh, you know, I have played around with is, oh, if we're making very small updates to values um, that are low precision, can we use something like stochastic rounding where you have a probabili uh, probability of increasing a value when you increment it by a very small value that's proportional to the um, to the kind of the fractional bit that's below the unit. Um, I haven't managed to get um, good results out of this. Um, there's been a lot more results uh, around 16-bit um, representations and 16-bit training. Um, I've seen 16-bit fixed point used, but um, the hard part always seems to be getting the ranges right. Um, so most, uh, because they get very large during uh, especially the initial parts of training. So most of the work I've seen is focused on floating point uh, representations in 16-bit. Um, and FP16 is the obvious place to start. Um, it came from the graphics world, um, and it has five bits for the exponent for the range, and then it has uh, 10 bits uh, for the fraction. Um, it's been well supported by GPUs and has traditionally been the 16-bit floating point that's been implemented by um, CPUs when one has been implemented. Um, more recently, uh, bfloat has um, come uh, become uh, popular for machine learning training uh, because it's found uh, that it's worked better uh, having the exponent um, be comparatively larger um, and have a smaller fractional um, section. Um, and it's used by a range of um, a range of devices out there. And one nice property is you can just lop off the bottom 16 bits of a uh, an IEEE float 32 uh, to get a uh, B float uh, version of the same number. And we have also been doing um, some work around doing training when you know that you're going to be deploying in quantization. And that can be really useful, as I mentioned before, to record the quantization ranges accurately, um, but also to actually help the network become even more robust to accuracy errors, uh, to rounding errors by inserting um, things that look like the kind of rounding errors you get during quantization um, during training so that the network learns to adapt and be even more resilient for them. Um, and you can find uh, some more information about um, TensorFlow's uh, support for that here. So that was quite a long run through of um, my uh, thoughts and experiences with quantization. Um, if you have uh, questions, uh, I'm Pete Warden on Twitter. Um, I've also got a YouTube playlist of screencasts like this talking about embedded ML. Um, and you can uh, get um, some more information um, from uh, the Tiny ML book as well. Um, and feel free to leave uh, comments on this video um, and, uh, you know, follow me. Uh, I'll hopefully uh, be producing a whole bunch more of these. So thanks for your time. I hope some of this was useful. And uh, let me know how you get on.